buenas tardes Les recordamos por favor respetuosamente ir tomando su lugar Daremos inicio en unos minutos We would like to remind you to take your seat We will start in two minutes
difficult. So good example is the uh, using the experiences of the behavior studies, uh, which are cognitive studies uh, uh, of how people make choices and how they act upon them. And these choices are not always the most rational ones. For example, uh, the basic uh, instinction, the general instinction to remain rather passive in situations is something public policy makers have to consider. Uh, my other point is that legal rules and regimes have become so complicated and almost impossible to follow for a normal citizen uh, that some kind of indirect and complementary forces are also needed. Recent Hungarian studies showed and proved that when only the official phrase of legal defender was replaced by the simple word lawyer, uh, the suspect, understanding the declaration of his Miranda rights, was improved immediately by 14%. Uh, and my other point to this uh, subject uh, refers to Rami's presentation before the lunch, uh, referring uh, that uh, public policies shall not ignore the needs and possibilities of the targeted groups, because no matter how brilliant a public policy on paper looks like, when it comes into effect in practice and it doesn't reach the targeted groups, then it makes no use at all. So this is, I think this is the subject uh, Ms. Dabishi is going to speak about, and let me introduce uh, our presenter. She's a human rights activist specializing in the public rights of access to information development of open and democratic societies with participatory and accountable governments. She is the founder uh, and executive director of the Madrid-based NGO Access Info Europe, established in 2006. She has worked over 20 years as a human rights professional, focusing on issues of freedom of expression and information, media freedom, civil society development, and democratization. And prior to setting up uh, this NGO, she has worked as a campaigner and project manager at Article 19, based in London and Paris, and for Open Society Institute, uh, where she directed specific programs in Budapest, and so in my country, <laughs> where she was living for three years, and in New York. She has provided expertise to a wide range of non-governmental and intergovernmental organizations, including UNESCO, Council of Europe, OSCE, and the World Bank. She is the founder of the Global Freedom of Information Advocates Network and served two terms uh, as to its chair. And in 2020, uh, she was uh, elected as the new chair of, of the UNCA, UNCA coalition, the network that coordinates civil society activity in monitoring and promoting the UN Convention Against Corruption. So Ms. Derbyshire, the floor is yours and we are looking forward to hear what you say for us. Thank you very much indeed, Julia. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good evening to those watching in Europe, or bon soir uh, in French. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to stand up and move around a bit. Thank you to the INAI for inviting me. It's great to be back in Puebla, to Blanca, Lily, and the whole team for organizing this event. Um, as you've heard, I've been asked to speak about innovation in transparency, um, and to do so in the context of the many democratic challenges that we face in the world right now. Uh, we're coming out of the COVID pandemic still. We have climate change. We have the most serious war in Europe since the Second World War. We have the knock-on effects of that on food security globally. We have an economic crisis that was already coming and is now getting worse. Um, uh, we have the rise of populism. Uh, so we have some really serious challenges. And I think the question then is, how do we use the right of access to information, transparency to address those challenges? And that's what I want to talk to you about now. Our right of access to information is being slightly curbed this, e this afternoon because We've got a problem with the PowerPoint presentation. Could we have the first slide? And if the, the little pointer isn't working, I'm just going to have to do it manually. Okay, so I was thinking about this presentation and the idea that I would give you new and innovative ideas. 
And then I remembered a book that I read a few years ago by a doctor and writer called Atul Gawande, highly recommended if you don't know his work. And he wrote this book called Better. And it's about how during the history of medicine, while yes, there have been scientific breakthroughs, in fact, a lot of the progress we've made in delivering better health care has just been by small incremental changes and doing little things that were already being done, but by doing them better. So to give one example that I recall from the book, there were two manufacturers of anesthesiology equipment. And one had a dial that went one way to turn it down, and the other manufacturer, the dial went the other way to turn it down. And for the anesthesiologist who wasn't paying attention to which manufacturer's equipment he or she was using, if they turned the dial the wrong way, well, you risked ending up with a dead patient. Simply by looking at that problem and making sure that both dials turned in the same way, lives were saved. Another example was to do with newborn infants, where they, that a series of 10 indicators were developed. And when a baby was born, its health was measured on these 10 indicators. And according to the score on those indicators, the doctors knew exactly what to do, whether the baby needed special treatment or not. That counting, measuring, and having a protocol resulted in saving the lives of many newborn infants. So, Inspired by that thought, uh, next slide please, I thought maybe we could look at what we're already doing and we could do better, because that in itself is a kind of innovation. So first of all, let's look at measurement while we're talking about counting, not about the health of newborn babies, but about the right of access to information. We've already heard today about some initiatives to measure this right. From UNESCO, we have the OECD, we have the Latin American network, the RTA. We have the RTI rating by the Center for Law and Democracy and my organization, Access Info. We have a lot of ways of counting, but do we really know where we are? When people ask me, journalists today, I've done a few interviews for journalists, and I've been asked, so what, who's doing better on access to information, Europe or Latin America? That's been the main question that they asked me. I don't know, to be honest, because I don't think that our counting is yet good enough. Could you, I need to have a signal for going through the slides. Could you press, click, please? Oh, this is frustrating. <laughs> data collection, next. <laughs> With the global data barometer, we recently looked in over 100 countries at how many of them have laws that require the data of collection on the implementation of the right of access to information. And we found that in fewer than 20% of countries globally, there are specific legal frameworks requiring proper data collection on implementation of access to information laws. That's clearly a problem. If we're not counting properly, we don't know how well we're doing, we don't know how to improve. Next, please. So I think that we need to look at how we measure better and we need clearly funding for those people who are doing measurement to be able to uh, do that measurement better and more accurately so that we can come to these ICIC meetings armed with data about how things are going in our country to compare our statistics so that we can have more constructive conversations about what we need to be doing. Next slide, please. The next slide is about how we meet the expectations of the public. We're talking about the digital age here at this event uh, this week in, Pue in Puebla. I was thinking about the speed with which most people now are able to access information from your computer, from your phone. You put a question into Google. You're thinking about something, you start typing, and before you've even finished typing your, your, your keywords, you've got an answer which quite often is right. The other day, I was talking to some friends about the environmental impact of data storage, which I think is relevant if we're talking about the storage and electronic archiving of information. How much is this? What's the carbon, uh, the CO2 output of all these data storage centers? So I went to put in, how to, in Spanish because it was in Spain, how to reduce the impact of uh, technologies. Well, I wrote the words how to reduce, 
And Google decided that I must be looking at how to reduce my blood pressure or how to reduce my cholesterol. Um, useful and important things to know, but when I put the word impact, then it realized I wasn't looking for blood pressure and cholesterol information and gave me actually a link to the answer that I wanted, which was the environmental impact of new technologies. Next slide, please. First point, please. So that's the expectation we have of how quickly we can get information. And yet, when any citizen presents an access to information request, what's the time frame going to be? 10, 15, 20 working days, possibly with a, a slight process for clarification and then an extension. It's a radically different time scale from the immediacy of information that we have on the internet. In a moment, I'll talk about disinformation and how we combat it. But if we want quick, true information to combat the false information that's out there, then clearly we need to think about how we improve our timeframes. So what could we be doing to increase those timeframes? Because what I see often in practice, and I'd love to know what your data tells you, is that the time frame set in the law is almost seen as the minimum, not the maximum. So I often get, if it's 15 working days, I get my answer on the 15th working day. If it's 20, I get my answer on the 20th working day. That's not what we should be aiming for. What can we learn about our internal systems for processing requests, for handling information, to improve the speed with which information is released in response to requests? That's a whole area for discussion. I'll just leave it with you for now. Maybe we can come back to it uh, in the questions or in the workshops tomorrow. Next, please. To the extent that information has been published proactively, uh, to be found quickly, it needs to be relatively easy to find. Uh, next. And it also needs to be clear and comprehensible once it is found. Too often, I at least, I don't know what your experience is, but I go to government websites and I find technical legal language, which is incomprehensible even to a fairly well-educated person. Um, and really, sometimes you, you, I feel one needs legal training to understand the text one finds on government websites. We need to think about how we have more information available in a plain and simply accessible language if we're going to meet the expectations of the digital age. Next. And the information needs to be relevant to the person who's looking for it. Next slide, please. So what about the relevance of information? This is a hugely important point. Because it, the information is not going to be relevant to everybody. And for different people, different information is going to be relevant. Um, we live in complex societies, so the information needs a complex. Do we have public policies? Do we have governments who really understand the information needs of different stakeholders? We've had sessions here this morning about the information needs of vulnerable groups, for example. Next, please. What are the stakeholder processes that we should be organizing in order to ensure that we're getting information out to the, to the people who need it in the right formats. This is something that was, as I said, was being discussed this morning with, I missed the session, but I, I really want to catch up on how it went with the Carter Center, Eurosocial and UNESCO. Um, I think the information commissioners in the conference could be looking at how to engage in these processes a bit better because you are people who know what kind of information requests you're getting. Hopefully if you're collecting data from your public authorities, you know what they're being asked for, you know what they're, hopefully, you know what they're publishing proactively, you know which information is being downloaded. So that overview of the information needs in your society could be incredibly useful for defining government priorities about which information to prepare for proactive publication or which information needs to be available, including in non-digital formats, to get to the people who need it. Right now, the Open Government Partnership, I sit on the Global Steering Committee of the Open Government Partnership. The Open Government Partnership is holding a series of stakeholder consultations defining its strategy for the future period. Part of that strategy undoubtedly will be looking at which kind of information should we prioritize encouraging be made public under Open Government Action Plans. I would really encourage, next please, please, 
the ICIC to engage in that process. Next, please. To give you an example of the kinds of information needs which seem to me to be pretty obvious, and yet we don't yet have the information. Keep clicking, please. Climate data, next, next. Okay, the Global Data Barometer looked in over 100 countries at the availability of three kinds of climate data. Data on emissions, data on biodiversity, and data on climate vulnerabilities. It was remarkable to see how, in how few countries this information was available. Uh, under 32% of the countries for emissions, only 20% for biodiversity, and only 21 for the availability publicly of information on climate vulnerabilities. That's really a problem when we have an urgent debate that we need to have in society about how we address climate change. I have to say that Europe was also really bad on climate vulnerabilities, which slightly surprised me. I thought we'd be better on that. Um, but it does show that there's a problem. Next slide, please. Click, 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 please. Okay, so I've said this. The ICIC could engage in these discussions about which is the information we need to be opening up. What about the information linked to the sustainable development goals? Is that proactively available in all your countries? What are the common standards we have? We do have increasingly standards for proactive publication, but perhaps they could be strengthened. Next slide, please. Digitalization. Next slide, please. Sorry, I really prepared this PowerPoint thinking I would have control. Do three clicks, please. Or two more. That's it. Stop there. Um, let's not think that digitalization belongs in a separate box from everything else we do. I don't think that you think this. And I think the, the very title of our conference shows that we're trying to integrate our thinking about digitalization and mainstream it into our transparency work. But not everybody does that. Um, and I think for many public officials, a digi digi digital means just having your documents in Word or PDF, not really thinking about access to databases, access to algorithms, etc. We all need to become experts in digital. We need to understand uh, what, what this means, how it works, to know the terminology. We heard talking this morning about things like blockchain. Uh, these are being used. Uh, in public life, people need access to information. What does that mean for transparency? We can't even have that discussion unless we know the terminology. One of the biggest problems we have when it comes to the digitalization of information is the sheer volume and qu quantity of information that we now generate every single day. And it's very hard to keep track of that and it's very hard to know which information we should be archiving. So to give you an example of a, a case that's going on right now in Europe, which is likely to get to the European Court of Human Rights, a journalist asked Ursula von der Leyen for her text messages, the president of the European Commission, for her text messages with the head of FISA uh, negotiating the contracts uh, for the vaccines. Now, we know that these messages exist because Ursula von der Leyen herself told the New York Times that she had been in text message contact with the head of Pfizer. So the journalist requested the information. Now, the response wasn't to deny this on, for example, grounds of commercial confidentiality or because um, it was needed to protect the decision-making process. No. The European Commission argued that text messages do not fall under its record-keeping policy. I think that's a real problem, and let's see what the court eventually says. But when we know that a lot of communication and many decisions are being taken by uh, WhatsApp, text messages, Slack, etc., we've perhaps won access to emails, but in many countries, we still don't have access to these other forms of communication. Is it being recorded? Are our decisions going to be traceable two or three years down the line if we're not archiving this kind of information as well? How do we do that? What are the rules? What are the standards? What are the best practices? There's a whole field of work for the ICIC to be discussing there, I believe. Next, please. Disinformation. I want to touch briefly on the issue of disinformation because it's such an important challenge for our democracies. That said, 
I do understand that disinformation is wider, it's broader, it involves questions of media freedom when you're trying to combat disinformation. I'm actually really glad I don't work on disinformation. I don't know how many people here do, but I'm glad that I don't specifically, because I think it's very hard to know how to address this problem. Um, so I just stick to the right of access to information. But there are transparency aspects to disinformation that we can identify. Next, please. Is the information... Ah, oh, you're not seeing any... You are? Okay. Oof, I just looked and saw the... <laughs> okay. <laughs> now I know how it works. They just flip back and forward, right? To keep the people on YouTube and Zoom happy. And then not just watching a PowerPoint. Okay. Don't panic. Timely information I've already mentioned. Next, please. Proactive transparency. Clearly, if we want to combat fake information that's floating around, the more accurate information that can be at our fingertips, the better. We saw that very clearly during the COVID pandemic. Next. Um, there's also certain sets of information which are needed uh, to have a proper debate about the media space um, and the media space in which disinformation is flowing. So, for example, transparency of the ownership of media is something I've worked on with the Council of Europe and the European Union to a, a certain extent and is going to be included as a topic in the EU's new media freedom bill. Um, there's a transparency dimension. They're linked to transparency of company ownership, media being companies after all. Transparency of advertising, of the spend of public money on advertising in the media. Um, to what extent is that supporting independent media? To what extent is it distorting our media space? This is information that we need in order to have a complete conversation about our media environment and disinformation. Next, please. Anonymous requests. Really briefly on this, but I think it's actually important and I needed to fit it in somewhere. Journalists working on questions of disinformation, organized crime, corruption, etc., tell me that one of the problems they have is that they can't make anonymous requests. Now, I know that in Mexico you can make anonymous requests and in a number of other countries, but there's a slight trend in Europe to require the ID of someone to make an information request. More and more countries are asking for that now and some EU-level bodies as well. And if you want to get access to certain data sets, such as the beneficial ownership registers of company, you have to identify yourself in order to get access to that information. Now, journalists say that that could put them at risk. And when they're trying to get information to combat, to, re, good information to combat disinformation or to track organized crime, there's a question there about whether we should not ensure that for these democratic imperatives, we really get work together to get rid of the ID requirements. And I'd like to think that that's something the ICIC could also look at. Next, please. Uh, I took this picture in the streets of Puebla yesterday, that feeling that you're being watched, um, that your data is being tapped. We heard about that already this morning. Privacy, next please, is a big issue. It's a huge democratic challenge. We need to ensure that for us as private individuals, our private data is protected. That was already discussed this morning. But there will be circumstances when the data that is being accessed or the people are trying to access with information requests, there will be moments when that data is also personal data under the definitions that we have of personal data. For example, when we're trying to get information about the assets declarations of public officials or about the spending of public funds, when we're trying to find out, as I've already mentioned, about who the owners or the beneficial owners of companies are. So it's not a clear-cut distinction, data protection, privacy on the one hand, the right of access to information on the other. Next slide, please. Do we have good comparative data about how we're doing the balancing on this? I'm not sure that we do. To give you one example, and, and, and do we think that, think that the rules are being applied in the same way? I can tell you, they're not. To give you one example on that, Access Info has been requesting from all 27 countries in the EU information, historical data on the spending uh, on agricultural subsidies. This data is put online for two years, but governments then take, tend to take it down. 
So it's information which we've had required to be public, the recipients of any agricultural subsidies over 1,250 euros. But then it's taken offline. We use the right of access to information to request the historical data. And the ver variety of responses we received in a region where every single country has the general data protection regulation has been really quite stunning. In about half the countries, sometimes following appeals to information commissioners or similar, we've got the information. The other half, we're still being denied this on protection of privacy. It's not even logical which countries are saying which. And this is in some cases, well, maybe in Luxembourg it's logical that we're not getting this, I don't know. But in Luxembourg, we're being denied information even when the recipient of the funding has received three, four hundred thousand euros of subsidy because they're a private farmer, so a private person. We need to be having a discussion. We need comparative information again to understand precisely how we're striking the balance. Because I see in some countries, you can get travel expenses of public officials, uh, no problem at all. In other countries, you can't because it's linked to their private data. We've got a very bad case from the European Court of Justice. Uh, some journalists tried to access MEPs spending and were denied it on grounds of personal data protection. We need to be having that discussion. I know that there are networks of data protection commissioners, but I think that the information commissioners need to be discussing these issues with your specific transparency lens. And let's look, next, next, please. Next. Okay, what are the standards? What are the standards when the people that we're requesting the information about are public actors? Next. What are the rules on use and reuse of this information? And how is this fit for the digital age? Because I know what the fear here is. The fear is that once the information is released, it's out there forever. We've even seen some really incredible examples recently of court documents not only having the names of the defendants being blacked out in some countries, but even the names of the judges being blanked out out of the fear that this is kind of on the public record, it's in the public domain forever. And whilst it was fine when these court records be, could be consulted in a more limited way, when they're put on the internet, there's this feeling of not being comfortable with the information being made public. How do we actually get that balance right? It's not easy, I think. It's something we need to be discussing. I've got three more points. They won't take long. Next, please. Three or four more points. Stronger oversight. Strengthening you. Uh, uh, I don't need to say much about this. We should be talking about it. What are our good standards for information commissioners? Um, what about the countries that don't have information commissioners? To what extent should we be promoting actively from the ICIC to those governments that, have, that are thinking about adopting uh, implementing information commissioners. I made a, a set of 30 recommendations recently for Ukraine, actually, before the war started, the Ukrainian government was looking at setting up an information commissioner. I recently gave the same recommendations to the authorities in Moldova. It was very interesting that I got a bit of resistance from Moldovan journalists, and I wanted to share this with you because I think it's just such a unique example of how an access to information law is enforced. The Moldovan journalists told me that in cases of administrative silence, uh, what they, a, pub, a public body doesn't answer the request within the, the time frame, they can actually go to the local police force and the police will issue a fine. No questions asked because it's a pretty clear cut case. And the journalists were a bit worried that if they have an information commissioner, that quick fast system to find the public authorities for administrative silence might be lost. I did try to argue that there are many other benefits to having information commissioners to promote this right. But that's the kind of discussion that you need to be engaging in as well. Next, please. And let's go to the next slide. I've got funding in there. Fight for more funding. For, we, we need more money to do all of this, I know. Next, please. And just click on both of them, please. Okay. Oh, stop. Back. Yeah. So... We're talking a lot about advancing the right of access to information. What about defending the right? During COVID, many of you had to step in because with the emergency laws, uh, the right of access to information, the timeframes were suspended, for example. And it was really interesting to see country by country, information commissioners stepping up 
and saying, no, this is a fundamental right in those countries where it is a fundamental right and defending the importance, particularly during the COVID pandemic, of keeping the, the, the channels open for processing requests for information and for answering them. That's something that you did at that particular moment in time. In general, uh, as the states of emergency have been repealed, as the pandemic has eased, those rules have gone anyway. But we have some countries, and Julia and I talked about this just before we started. Hungary, since 2020, still has in place the emergency rules, which have extended the timeframes to 45 plus 45 days, if I'm not wrong. So um, we have countries and, and this is, and now with the war in Ukraine, the, emergent, the state of emergency has been renewed, and these rules which make uh, a longer time frame for getting responses to access to information requests, as well as one or two other limitations, are still in force. That's a concern. Uh, it's great that you're here at the ICIC to be able to talk about that, and to think what could this community do to react to uh, both this situation and one or two other negative changes to the access to information law over the past few years in Hungary. How do you respond when one of the ICIC members comes under serious attack uh, in a particular country? Um, what are your policies? What are your, what's your way of reacting to do that? I think it's good to be thinking ahead to those kinds of circumstances and putting in place uh, mechanisms for responding. It's something in the Open Government Partnership that we have uh, a series of pro uh, protocols for when there's a problem in a particular country. Next, please. All of this is about generating political will. Um, we need to be clear on the benefits of transparency. We need to keep arguing the benefits. But I don't think that we should shy away from addressing the fears that public officials have. There are multiple fears. Um, I'm sure all of you have heard them. Um, what will happen when the information is made public? It will be used to criticize me. The public will not understand this information. They will find errors in the information. Um, uh, they, they will use it against me, as, as the British Prime Minister Tony Blair famously said, why give people another stick with which to beat you? He was talking about the Freedom of Information Act. Um, I've heard an argument made that if we have more transparency, we will start losing history because nothing will be written down. That's why we need rules on record keeping, in order to ensure that in spite of transparency, we have good data that is recorded and that, um, next, can you click please? Address the fears, Don't, proactively address the fears, next. And all of this is because without political will, we don't have money to strengthen our transparency systems. We really need to work on addressing the political will because it is amazing how little money uh, there is in access to information, in transparency. Um, if you look at the amount of funding that data protection commissioners have compared with information commissioners when they're separate bodies in various countries, it's a really stark difference. The number of people working on transparency, the amount of training that needs to be done, um, we're living in the information age. This is a really important democratic right, and yet we're not putting sufficient resources into it. Last one. Collaboration and information sharing. I don't need to say more about that because it's what we're doing here right now. Just, I've got two more slides quickly. This is the list of the measures I proposed. At the workshop tomorrow, we can maybe talk about them in a little bit more detail. Happy to take questions and ideas right now. I really think it would be great for civil society to work with the ICIC and the intergovernmental organizations who are here with us today as well in order to advance with this agenda. Next, please. Um, we need to be thinking about transparency by design, but I think all of this is transparency by design. It's by thinking about the different elements of our transparency systems and ensuring that in each one, whether it be preparing for privacy um, uh, or, or whatever it may be, that we're actually building this in to our transparency systems within and external to government. Next. We need information because it's key to defending democracy, particularly in the information age. And as the title of this conference says, next, um, without information, we will not have participation and inclusion. So, thank you very much for your attention and look forward to discussing these matters with you. Thank you.
So, thank you very much for this extremely colorful presentation. I have two short comments. We have just learned that in Estonia, uh, the text messages of a minister uh, were asked as a single uh, data request, and they were provided without without problem. I, I wonder if it were the case in Hungary as well. And the anonymous request is being guaranteed by the Tromso Convention, which is a Council of Europe international agreement and it came into effect with the ratification of poor Ukraine, it was the last country to ratify it. But it guarantees, it guarantees. I, I hate to correct you, Julia, but uh, with all due respect, it doesn't guarantee it because I was present during the drafting of the Tromso Convention. This is the European region one. And what it actually says is that member states may permit anonymous requests and that may was negotiated because there were some countries which said we don't want to commit to that. So it's, thank you for the correction. Yeah, it's because, a pleasure. Because we interpret it as it, oh, good. it's a must. <laughs> well, <laughs> given the Hungarian language, maybe it got lost in translation. I don't know, but um, it's. I, I'm glad that you translated. I, maybe we should try that in all languages. May is must, right? <laughs> And my takeaway from, from your presentation is that the scientific approach is very important uh, when uh, planning a public policy and when performing it as well. And that you give the ICIC new roles and duties. <laughs> so we are very happy to, to hear it. I'm also fundraising for you. I don't know if we've got any donors in the room, but we need money to do all of this, right? <laughs> So th there are the tests to engage in priority processing processes, uh, setting up standards for public actors, uh, stronger standards for the oversight bodies, record keeping rules, and educate education uh, awareness raising. So these are all the tests which the ICIC as an international network and body and, and forum uh, <laughs> must be taken. So thank you very much, and we are waiting for the questions, if you have. Agradecemos a nuestras panelistas por su participación y recordamos respetuosamente que se tienen disponibles micrófonos para realizar las preguntas, los cuales serán entregados levantando su mano. So if you have questions or comments, please raise your hands. Sí, eh, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Marcos. My name is Marcos. Eh, y es más un comentario well, a lo que dijo Helen de aquí, Helen, Helen, Helen del otro lado, mirando Helen, a la here on the other side. izquierda tuya. To your left, eh, Helen. <laughs> Okay, so you mentioned a really important topic. I think that the commissioners and in general the departments of access information when you were talking the measurements, do you talk about several instruments? You talk about the UNESCO tools, we have the Complutense, Universidad Complutense in Madrid, we have the Carter Center, we have CLD, we have several tools. You mentioned it, funding, that we have limited funding. But if we have limited funding, then I think that what we should do is to step up to coordinate better the mechanisms. When the fundings are limited for this topic, I think that the commissioners need to be more proactive in this topic because they are going to get question about how are they using this money. So this yes, is I more think, a comment you, Max, than a I think it's something really important. If I'm not wrong, and I can, I'm happy to be corrected on this, I think that the data collection that was done by the RTA in the Latin American region was actually used to feed into the UNESCO survey. I'm happy to be corrected on that, but totally. The sharing of the... We're, we're really... It's only in the last two or three years that we're really properly starting to do this. So, uh, pool resources and pool share... Discuss methodologies, um, which is also something that's on the agenda, uh, I think... Uh, Toby Mendel from the CLD is looking at discussing the methodologies for data collection as well, for measurement. So I, I think really working together on this would be much more efficient. And it is shocking when we look at some of the other SDGs, because this is a, UNESCO is doing it as one of the SDG indicators. It is absolutely shocking that we're in other fields, uh, health, education, economics, whatever, we have well-established systems of measurement when it comes to transparency, we're only just at the very beginning. So yes, absolutely, collaboration.
Thank you. I, I didn't actually say that they're in conflict per se. Oh, putting the translation there. Not necessarily in conflict, um, but they have different roles, which sometimes overlap or touch. Um, I think Julia should answer this question as well. I'm agnostic. Um, I've kind of chosen to be agnostic on whether or not we should have separate or mixed commissioners. Um, I think there's pros and cons. What is most important, and I mentioned these 30 recommendations, is that the part, whether it's a separate body or it's part of a data protection authority, the part that is overseeing the right of access to information needs to have a series of powers and a sufficient level of resourcing, funding, and human resources in order to do its job well. Whether it's a separate body or whether it's uh, part of one body with different departments, there needs, of course, to be dialogue and collaboration. Um, the people who bring their data protection perspective and the people who bring their transparency perspective. Um, I think my concern more was, within a country, these things are being worked out, country by country, but the results that we're getting, the place where the balance is struck, is different country by country. Um, and I think that that's a problem. So it's something that needs to be uh, international as well as coordinated within a country. But I, I don't have a strong position on, I don't have the data to have a strong position on the pros and cons of one versus the other. You have a, a you, you're a joint body, so what do you think, Julia? Okay, so uh, we are a joint body, uh, supervising both rights from the very beginning, from 1992. And I can say that we take advantage of this situation, first of all, because uh, we just enjoy uh, the powers of the data protection uh, authority, which in normal, normally in freedom of information cases we might not use. We use these powers in very extreme situations when the two uh, rights, the right to privacy and the right to freedom of information are in conflict with each other. And then uh, we must do this balancing, uh, what uh, Helen was mentioning. And in these cases, uh, not always, but in most of these cases, we use the authority uh, powers and the uh, administrative procedures. And we may also use the powers of given by the GDPR, so we may, function, we, we may impose fines, very high fines, up to 20 million euros uh, against those uh, data controllers who, on the other side, uh, don't follow the transparency rules. So this is a very tricky <laughs> way of using the two powers, but uh, from our point of view, it's, it's a good position. There are things that are classically in data protection rules, such as the power to inspect the information. Um, which not all ombudsmen will have, for example. So I, I think it's about the powers that you have. That, that, that's quite a heavy fine you can issue. That's more than the Moldovan police, I think. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so National Information Commission of uh, Nepal. Uh, well, I think it's a very nice presentation by Helen. And I, I we can understand that uh, you have given quite a lot of work to ICIC. That means us. Anyway. It's a very good uh, opportunity for, for us as well to understand what we have to do. Um, uh, in that uh, context, I, I think I should have um, like a sort of a suggestion on, um, uh, well, I don't know whether, uh, what is the situation in a number of countries, like uh, in Nepal, I, um, National Information Commission has given in 14 years, we have given more than 100 of uh, recommendations to the government, and uh, they, have, uh, they haven't implemented even one. That means whether uh, IC, I think it's better to have international standard on uh, access to information by ICIC, but whether that will be implemented by the governments in a uh, number of countries is, is another question. So in that context, what I was uh, thinking of is like, uh, whether ICIC can pursue it to the 
uh, multinational, uh, multilateral organizations, or let us say UN agencies to implement those uh, those standards or recommendations by ICIC to the countries or governments of the countries so that they will implement. Because it is not always true that whether we uh, information commissioners recommend them and then they will implement. And it's a kind of, quite a bit difficult situation in, I think, most of the countries, I believe. Well, that is true in my country anyway. So um, that is my uh, only suggestion. Thank you very much. I think that's really interesting. The problem of non-compliance with the recommendations, particularly for those commissions, commissioners, ombudsmen, uh, which have oversight of access to information laws and don't have the sanction power, don't have the binding power, is it's really an issue. In Spain, the, information, the Transparency Council puts on its website and, and updates a list of the public bodies that haven't complied with its decisions. Um, but that's not an incredibly strong sanction and is not guaranteed to have an impact. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. The ICIC could do, again, I'm just inventing work for you as if there were unlimited resources, but a comparative report about levels of compliance and what are the kind of solutions to that and what has experience in other countries taught us is more likely to work to help make a difference. That would be something that would be useful to do. Um, so I, I think these are the kind of problems, identifying what problems you have at individual country levels and think, thinking how you can leverage the power of this network to help you address your problems. I guess that's what I'm, in essence, what I'm proposing with many of these points. I think it's very exciting that we're all together here again after the pandemic, meeting in person this 13th conference of the information commissioners. It's a shame there aren't slightly more people here, but hopefully for the 14th one, there will be. And maybe we can take forward some of these ideas in the meantime. Um, well, really, sort of briefly on this, because I think it's quite a complex issue. I, I think one thing is how information gets to certain groups of people, um, not only by digital. When we talk about proactive publication, we also have to think about the vehicles for delivering information. Um, but I think that we also need to look at uh, the, the structures that are in place to help people actually use that information uh, I was talking earlier to one journalist who was interviewing me about um, the role of education in preparing people to actually be able to, to understand and process information, and then the participation mechanisms that are available to be able to make use of the information once obtained. Um, so we're really talking about the nature of our democratic structures here, which goes beyond purely the right of access to information. Just as with the fight against corruption, Transparency is really helpful, but it's not uh, the magic solution to absolutely everything. Every problem we've got with corruption, you also need to have prosecutors, 
and judges, independent courts and so forth. I think also with ensuring that different sectors of the population are able not only to receive information, but use it and engage in decision-making processes once they have that information, also requires complementary mechanisms to be put in place. I don't know if that's fully answered your question, but those are, that's a sort of thought that I have listening to you. Muchas gracias. Helen, una de las preguntas que quizá pudiera surgir como en el seno de la cooperación internacional es Arise from these cooperation, ¿no? which o sea, tools es are you de, looking de, at? De I know that this is a reason for a deeper analysis, gracias. but where to go? No estoy seguro que he entendido completamente la pregunta. ¿Podrías repetir? ¿Qué? Sí, claro. Which tools, which tools or instruments can we use to boost a cooperation focused on these new policy, uh, public policies generation? We put it as a space of commissioners of information, boosting all of these ex exchange spaces and looking at where to go to innovate. I think it's really a question of the ICIC and your members being present in some of the, the existing forums. So I've mentioned the Open Government Partnership, for example. Um, and as I said, what I see is that in some countries, the information commissioners are engaged in the processes, in others not. And at the level, and I know you're going to be addressing this right this week by having someone from OGP here at the conference on Friday to talk about the new OGP strategy. But I would like to see a much stronger presence of the ICIC in the Open Government Partnership Forum. We've got, you are collaborating with UNESCO, we've got the OECD here. Um, so I think it's a question perhaps of doing, doing a, a, an evaluation of the existing mechanisms and then figuring out how and where to engage. And if necessary, from civil society, um, you mentioned that I'm on the UNCAC coalition, the, 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 the global network of anti-corruption NGOs around the UN Convention Against Corruption. There are transparency requirements in there, but I've never come across an information commissioner engaging with those processes. Um, how those mechanisms feed into public policy will depend a little bit on country by country, but there are certain spaces where debates are taking place these days. I think the other huge challenge is with the transparency community, but if we want to be engaging with the debates on transparency around climate, for example, it means actually also linking to the uh, people in government uh, and the international fora that are discussing climate, for example, uh, climate change or, or health. That's, that is, again, a lot of work. So perhaps it's a question of mobilizing, connecting with people inside your governments um, to make sure that the information flows to those other fora about the, the transparency, the information perspective. I don't know if that fully answers the question. It was perhaps slightly a, a rather general answer. But maybe in the workshop tomorrow, that's also something we could look at more precisely um, and do a bit of a mapping of uh, where are ICIC members currently really engaged or in Europe, at the European Union level, for example, or the Council of Europe, or the Organization of American States. Um, we've got a lot of inter intergovernmental processes, um, and it gets quite time-consuming after a while, but maybe dividing up the work. You go there, I'll go here, she goes over there, and we report back to each other. Um, that, that's another way of approaching these things. I think it's great that we've got various different bodies and mechanisms represented here, this week, and I hope that that's a strong basis for future collaboration. Uh, hi, all. Uh, my name is Arham. Viera Acuña, host of everyone. Very happy to have you here. Now, you talked about something very important, the anonymous part of the requests. And this is something that has distinguished or has been distinguished in the Mexican law. But some other time, 
we've had great resistance to tolerate this condition which is key of the autonomy of the right to information and that is to say that we do not have any pre-requirements and of course of course identifying who makes this request that more than a request i call them a claim, an uh, informative uh, claim, because the request has certain, like, we here in Mexico, we always talk with euphemisms. So, so the, no, they are trying to to complain about something and when we say okay so who is asking or claiming this information we send this or we neutralize the scope and not only for the journalists that with all reason they need to uh, to be safe in their condition especially when talking about requests talking about the connections in organized crime and state and their government in Mexico here we have uh, a very bad situation and obviously journalists that cover this uh, power, this criminal power are, are the most vulnerable ones, but the population in general, all, all I mean, they ask things that they they, they try to surprise the institution the day that with Mexico, with this resistance that it's not big to this right. There's people, there are voices that want to reform the the law, the Mexican law, to put a lock on this, on who is exercising the right. We have to defend this, and I think that the ICIC's opportunity of being together is looking forward for the countries where this matter exists is taken down, because in such a way, and only in that way, we can see that that's efficient. This was an opportunity to share because the anonymous part is still, unfortunately for Mexico, a critical front, open critical front that is there. The danger of not losing that condition. Pues Thank you very much, Helen. Yes, and you can come to Spain because we are talking about this with the government. So we can... We can, we're talking about this anonymous um, request. request. So who's, who's, who's requesting this? What are they going to do with the opportunity, with this information? This is what we need. And now we thank our panelists for your participation in this 13th edition of the International Conference of Information Commissioners. And now we will have two sessions in simultaneous well. The first one in this same auditorium, transparency by design as an efficient way to promote and increase transparency. And the second one will be held in Oriental and is access to information, misinformation and freedom of expression in the digital era. We remind our audience that both sessions have simultaneous interpretation, English, Spanish, and French. And this service is right on the lobby of this auditorium. Thank you very much. ¿Qué pasó? Si les conectaste ya. Ya, ya funcionó bien. Ya funcionó bien. Lo que pasó en la
just her translation. Can you just confirm? So I'm going to read the trigger questions, and I will give the floor to our participants who are who will have space. So first question is, what are the advances and the challenges that you have identified in your institutions to implement the actions in matters of transparency by design? Second question, what are the advantages in the government in the government and in the society to have programs to, that contribute to the transparency and that that thrive the culture of government open openness. And third, can you elaborate of any of the policies that you have applied that have had really good results in your country? So let's let's begin with our first panelist. Please, Adam Lassiet. Adam Lassiet, you have 15 minutes, sir. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me introduce myself. I would like to to thank to all the organizers of this conference, specifically. I would like to thank to INAI Mexico. Thank you, Miss Miss Commissioner. Uh, you have allowed us to be part of the works of this conference. I would like to thank you to the organizers. Who have allowed me to be here, and that it, thank you for the opportunity for for having this a space for sharing my work with you, and to be I'm very really happy and glad to be in this in this in this beautiful city. So first of all, I'm going to talk about. For my as as my primary activity as judge, this is well. We have been integrating the transparency and the access to information. So under this umbrella, as a judge, that it is as a judge that I need to forget about my obligations. To remain silent, you know, there is an obligation that stops us when we are judges. So, under this umbrella, just forget that I was a judge. So, working as a commissioner is a new role to me. I need to forget of this disclosure. Clauso. So a judge that is observing, who is observing I mean, we need to have the openness towards the individuals to provide proactively the information that they require. And I really I really need to to really face the situation in which the information is not completely sure. So the experience that we have had in Tunis, what kind of work have we done regarding the access to information and this new culture of transparency? In Tunis, I think that we have given huge steps forward because, as you know, in Tunis, in Tunisia, we have instituted this as a right since the year 2011 with the promotion of a law 41 2011 regarding to the access to public information. And then after this, in 2014, we a new law went in force, the Organic Law 2016, 
that is relative to the right of access to information that in virtue of this law, Tunisia has created the body of access to information, which is kind of the INAI in Tunis. You know, we even kind of share the same name. You know, so according to what I can see, what I observe, and what I believe, there is a dynamic. A dynamic is necessary. The part of the services that are implied in the diverse countries, so we can fulfill with the with the with the task, with the duty of providing this information in a proper and agile way. And this is a way that we have been dealing with in my country. It is a service that is in place in different countries. So in different countries, so we can do it this in an agile way and respond to all the requests of information by the citizens and the stakeholders. We should agree on updating our of updating periodically the programs that we have for transparency and the records of the request because these are the main sources of, of access to information. Here we can track the budgets, we can track the proposals, we can track the audits, and it has a direct impact. So, in my opinion, it has a full impact on the public activities. So we are fostering the responsibility of the public. We are empowering the public. So as an interim president of the access to information body in Tunis, in Tunisia, so from our, from my legal perspective, according to my personal observations, some problems are persistent, and it is a big challenge to achieve transparency in a proactive way, a proactive way that responds to the required standards in such matters, and that go with the needs of the citizenships. So these are the main situations that we are facing, and it is evident, and I need to underline this situation, we have the obligation that is of the matter of the different public structures to create websites. It is a, a necessary it is necessary for disseminating the information. It has to do with the bodies that we are talking about. It has to do with all the development of all the sections that are included in the transparency program, since this instrument is still the main source of information for the citizenship and for everything that has to do with the public power. So it is stated that the public organisms must, in a tough time of six months since the enforcement of the law, they need to create a website. But we have a really worrying delay in such sense because the law has stated that a system and a digital system must be created to manage to manage the documentation. So there is a lack of means, but what we try to do is that we try to work with the goal of the sensibilization, the information so people get to know this new law and to talk to the to the public officers in Tunisia because if we do not change their minds we are not going to move forward it will be impossible so we need to change the culture change the mindset and fundamentally it needs to modify the mindset of the public officers who are in a straight touch with the citizens.
Muchísimas thank gracias. you, thank you very much, thank you very much. And then, that's it. Now we're going to listen to Marcos Lindmayer, Linden Mayer. He's he's the general director of the CGU in Brazil. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much. It is my pleasure that after two years of pandemic, we are together here. I am really happy to see that that we're working with this community and that we are still here together at ISIC. Now let me talk about how the discussion in Brazil started. We recently had the law of data protection in Brazil. In Brazil, and when we started this implementation of the law process, one first point was that they had to adopt the privacy by design. And experts who talked about this privacy law always said that there was a great difference between the implementation to access to information and the data protection law. The access to information is 10 years now in Brazil, so it's already implemented. But what happened is that the access to information law had an impact exposed implementation that is to say that when you have when you implement that you need to do this and you have to give access to information somehow and on the other hand the data protection law had an implementation uh, that it's the whole the whole process of the life cycle of this it had to be handled in such a way with the principles of privacy by design but this is not true and we know that. We know that access to information laws have an implementation exempt, but it's not done a lot of times. So after 10 years of implementation, we keep making the same information in the same way. That is to say, with the same bad speeches of uh, information handling that sometimes they deny this access to information because of an insecurity or because there is no way to separate because sometimes all of these are public we, and some of them are private or personal or are under secret. So probably a first point for this is an opportunity as well. The privacy agenda sometimes comes uh, stronger than the access to information in a lot of places because of the economical power. And this is also an opportunity to implement privacy by transparency by design. So that is a first point as an opportunity. And more than that, there are some difficulties in comprehension of information and the role of making this information in our society. A lot of our guarant bodies have as a root the control. And so the idea on accessing information, um, it's, it's related to accountability. But access to information is not only in accountability. Uh, in the morning, we had a very interesting panel about the rights of this and how can they access these rights through the right to access to information. That is to say, this has a re relation with all the rights. And interesting, it's interesting to know when we're looking for transparency, if the con that the concept is not that clear. We were only missing the requirements for the management of information, but for what? Because if it was just accountability, it's going to be right that we're going to see all the articles of practical applications of transparency by design, and this is going to be related to data openness and accountability for 
these strategies to handle these informations and give access to information in a proactive way. But more than that, when we see the transparency cycle, which is the cornerstone for transparency by design, we see the need to understand the public policies on the ways uh, and who are the, sometimes it's us, sometimes it's us, but also the citizens that have to have access to all of this information, to so have access to all of those basic rights, not only of social control, but also health, education. And for example, in Brazil, in Brazil, the first time that we started looking or doing this job, a little bit more organized on implementation with methodology talking about transparency by design, we started with vulnerable, people in vulnerable situations. That is to say, it is true that what we define, uh, I mean, which are the findings of the matrix of all of this in the concrete cases of the citizenship. I mean, we don't have information about this, and the state does not have this information. The state does not produce this information of the public policies that we have in the citizenship. And that is a problem. That is to say we have a double invisibility, double invisibility of people, but also to management. And more than that, we have we don't have clear information on how to access to all of these services, and sometimes there is information on how to access all of this, but not for these people, not for users. And this is what we do: users, users don't have information about how to access to these services or how to exercise their rights. They cannot be part of the decision making on the policies that influence their lives. And also, they do not have this accountability. And that is to understand the concept of transparency by design. In a wide time that the idea that not only the one that is going to make the social control, but the one that needs to live from these, and they need to exercise their basic rights in society, I think that it's on the DNA of transparency by design. And I don't think that that is a problem that us, in terms of guarantee institution, we see the policy in a more general point of view. We go back to context, and they, and it's not necessary. We need to know the context of the use of information. And normally, uh, well, and next year, we're going to keep on doing this investigation and this research on the processes that exist on the gaps and how transparency can be useful. And actually, when we get to the end of the process, we see that this is a tool, a diagnosis tool, of the capability of the states to communicate with society. And this is a way of looking at past years and see that sometimes we've done the necessary job to implement all of this. And But this is also a common route for everyone. And I think that's why it is important, or the importance of I seek to start with a job with the work groups dedicated especially to transparency by design. For what we have, that's why we have another opportunity to talk about this. But that, I think those are the main points. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcos. And now we will give the floor. Here we have online Angeline Fork. He is Commissioner of Information of Australia. So, and Angeline, the floor is yours. Up to 15 minutes, please. Okay, solamente reviso que me puedan escuchar. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, comisionada, y muchas gracias por la oportunidad, darme la oportunidad de contribuir el día de hoy. 
uh, discuss these very important issues with colleagues. Uh, but today I join you from Sydney, Australia, the traditional uh, owners of the land of the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation, and I pay my respects to uh, the elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my fellow panel members, uh, ICI members here today appearing uh, virtually and in person. It's, it's great to have this opportunity to talk about this very important issue of transparency by design. Uh, I would like to make some remarks around the frameworks for transparency by design. Uh, as we discuss the contributions and advances and, and challenges of transparency by design as a mechanism uh, and how we can use that to address uh, public problems in the digital age. If we recall last year's conference, uh, we will remember that the conference passed a resolution about proactive publication relating to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and members joined together to uh, say to the world that there is value in proactive publication of information in relation to COVID-19 at a time when governments were making decisions that affect the rights and obligations uh, of global citizens. That was a significant milestone for the conference to join in that way. Uh, and since that time, uh, at, at domestic matters in Australia, uh, we are a member of the Open Government Partnership, as, as many members of the ICI will be. Uh, and we've worked together at the Australian national and sub-national uh, levels to create some open by design principles. And these principles urge governments in Australia and public institutions to build in transparency and openness by design. We all saw during the pandemic the importance of receiving information in a timely way that allowed the citizens to perform their part and their role in protecting public health. Those principles remain true, not only in the health sector, but right across the areas uh, of government activity. At the national level, the office that I administer, the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, regulates the Freedom of Information Act. And under that act, we have a number of levers to build in transparency and openness by design. I think it's useful to uh, discern what we mean by transparency and open by design. It's about ensuring openness by default. It requires governance and process to ensure that there's forethought around the way in which information is handled and made available to our citizens, rather than it being an afterthought or a reaction. In the institution that I lead, we administer both access to information under freedom of information laws and also data protection and privacy laws. And so we can learn from the frameworks that have been long standing in relation to data protection. Privacy by design, too, seeks to ensure that the handling of personal information occurs in a secure way, in a transparent way by default. In an access to information context, those principles mean that we need to ensure that the vast array of information that's being created in our digital economy and created by government is created in such a way to be discoverable, to be accessible, to be machine readable and interoperable. It ensures accountability and integrity, but it also is a lever for innovation. 
It allows others to use the information held by government as a national resource for the economic and social well-being of all citizens. Turning to the Freedom of Information Act in Australia, the levers that exist under that legislation do require proactive publication. That's not the case across all FOI legislation in Australia. At the national level, government agencies are required to proactively publish information under an information publication scheme. And that means that the citizens can expect certain categories of information to be published by default. The Act also requires government agencies to publish the information that they release under the Freedom of Information Act after a request by an individual to the world at large. And they do this through publishing on a disclosure log, usually on their website. The challenges to effective access to information are vast, particularly in a fast moving digital economy. Government agencies have challenges in ensuring that they manage their information holding efficiently and effectively alongside their other responsibilities. And each year, my office receives statistics from government agencies around how they're complying with freedom of information requests. And what we see is over the last three years is a steady downward trend in timeliness. One of the advantages of proactive transparency by design is efficiency. Government agencies who look at their information holdings and discern what is of most value to their citizens and take steps to proactively publish it will also reduce the number of access to information requests. This also ensures that the information that's of most importance to Australians is made available by default. We've seen some success in this strategy. The numbers of requests to government agencies for personal information has decreased over the last year by a significant amount. This is in part as a consequence of some government agencies using administrative access systems to allow their citizens to seek information about themselves through online portals. We also see broader initiatives across government agencies to make non-sensitive information available by default. And in Australia, we have data.gov.au that provides a vast amount of data that can be reused uh, by anyone with access to the internet. And we also have a transparency portal, which is a collective contribution of annual reports and other corporate information of government uh, entities across the country. I'd like to conclude by referring to the open by design principles that were developed by my colleagues across Australia and released last year, because I think they're an example of a proactive framework that can assist to increase the amount of information that is proactively made available by government agencies and public institutions. The principles require entities to embed proactive disclosure by default and that this should be determined at the start of projects when developing services and policies. It requires consideration of what documents will and should be produced, how they can be made publicly available proactively and engaging with the community taking a, a customer service approach to identify the information that's of most value and interest. 
In Australia, state jurisdictions have also focused their regulatory activities on encouraging proactive transparency by design. For example, my colleagues at the Office of the Victorian Information Commissioner released a discussion paper on proactive and informal release of information in the Victorian public sector last year. They seek to build a better understanding of agencies' views, challenges and practices in relation to proactive and informal release and identify pathways to assist. And in New South Wales, I understand that the Information and Privacy Commissioners have a research project to examine and maximise the use of informal access information pathways under that state legislation. And finally, my office places proactive design, proactive and open publication and transparency at the forefront of our legislative and regulatory priorities through the initiatives of the Information Publication Scheme, the publication of disclosure logs, and supporting the use of administrative access arrangements by government agencies. In this way, we support our representative democracy and citizens' contribution to the decisions of government. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Go oh, to a second round to close up and to have the conclusions for each one of the panelists up to three minutes. And now we go back with Annette Lessi. Voy a tomar la ocasión que se me presenta para poder responder a una pregunta que like INAI in Mexico, or, for example, the case of Switzerland or Germany. But the answer is clear for us. And the election of the legislator at that moment is very important to explain this point. For us, for Tunis, the election of the legislator in that moment, that is to say between 2014 and 2016, since the law was voted in March 2016 and was prepared since 2014. So the election was to have two different authorities, two separate authorities. And this is what we wanted, one that was in charge of the personal data, that is the IMTP, and the other one that is in charge of access to information information with uh, jurisdictional competence, explicit jurisdictional competence, because access to information is a court. It's a court on the topic of contention related to the right to information. It's a first degree of jurisdiction. So we make decisions, we make uh, legal decisions that are going to be done and that are susceptible, a kind of answer in the administrative level. So this was done that way, this election, this structural election was justified in its moment of adoption because of the fact, and this is very important to mention, because of the fact that the country is and still is in a transition, democratic transition phase. After 2011's revolution, as you already know, and because of these two cultures, the protection of uh, personal data on one side and access to information on the other hand with solid bases. 
That is to say, to guarantee the best that we can so that citizens and Tunisian legislators of the public administrator are full of these two cultures in the most optimal way. And this took me to a way where we can have changes in the future, but for now, but for now, what the legislator adopted, this election is to have these two separate authorities to value each one of the values of these two universal rights, to do it in a separate way. And Toby Mendel is here with us, and he has a clear idea on this election. He was several times in Tunis, and we could benefit from his experience and also from his uh, advice. And I think that Toby Mendel's print is present, is present, and we can notice in this election. And for us, it was pretty clear that we have to have two different authorities. So we can guarantee these with solid foundations for each one of the cultures in a separate way. And after that, and this is something that I personally, as a president, not temporal, but this is not something that I would like for now. Or at least we will have we will need to have 10 years so we can have these clear foundations, this culture to access to information, so this culture of transparency in Tunis, because we always do this resistance with them. And I've always said that we have to wait. We have to wait and we have to get rid of this whole generation and to have a good generation so we can achieve and we can create this culture of openness of the administration, of the public administration, respecting citizenship. We have one of the best laws in the world, and we are in the 14th out of 136 laws in the world. That is to say that here we had all the international standards. We answer all the international criteria in our law. So in the implementation part, we always try to apply in the best way as possible this law. And it is true that, yes, we are still struggling, especially in the non-compliance of the regulatory framework to access to information in Tunis. The, the laws of the Comprehensive Law of 2016 still take long to exist, and I'm talking about the degree of this, the particular status of this, the status that it's going to manage the responsible for the designated access in every public structure. I mean, in the compliance of this framework of access to information in Tunis, it's kind of hard to manage, but we have the will, and it's a strong will. We need to go further. We need to progress in this topic and we need to have this culture on access to information and transparency. Thank you very much. Well, and our next panelist, Marco, your turn. Thank you very much. Well, I love the idea of making all of this context in talking about structure and talking about the constitution in Brazil, the access in how is it fundamental transparency by design to guarantee this uh, participation right? And you know, the current concession comes from a regime, a military regiment that had the, the provision 
like more than what we know. All of this advice, which is a way of citizen participation, which are very well known. But in 1990, there were some changes in the Constitution to add like a second generation of the citizen participation that had something different because of its feature. That is to say, if the advice, it is important to have this process to represent something in the access to information request and the person is representing themselves in the exercise of their rights. And in that context, even though we've created a kind of some kind of rights related to citizen participation, first one is access to information. The second one is related to the evaluation of this and and the right to file the irregularities in the administration. This is something for the citizen participation in the public administration, which is on the Brazilian Constitution of 1998. But so for this to be effective, it was necessary to start with this implementation or the rules to access to information through this access to information. So when when we talk about transparency by design and when we implement all of these methodologies designed to guarantee transparency, a more efficient and transparency, we become more efficient and effective. So those would be my last points. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco. So we're going to listen to the conclusion of Jeline. Go ahead, Commissioner. Muchísimas gracias. Solo a mí, a mí solo me gustaría hablar de los compromisos que hemos hecho como miembros del ISIC el año pasado para tener esta apertura proactiva. I think today's discussion has Entonces, allowed us to Diego. affirm the value of transparency by design and openness by design. Uh, the, the value proposition is that it informs community, it increases participation and enhances decision making. It builds trust and confidence. It can improve service delivery. It can support innovation and improve efficiency. For all of us, it needs to be required or permitted by law, and we need the national framework to support government agencies to take this approach. I think the current challenge that we face relates to the volume of information produced by government and public institutions, the use of artificial intelligence and automated decision making, and how we ensure transparency by design in these new technological, technological environments. I know that those issues are matters being discussed by other panels today, and I look forward to the opportunity uh, to review their insight. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute today. My beloved colleague, Julieta del Rio, who has been an excellent moderator, oh, I want to, to salute you, Angeline. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. I don't know, we've been working for seven and eight years for now, right? Right, because we have been working together for a long time, uh, mainly in the APAC meetings, in the part of the protection of personal data. INAI is at the front of, of both. In the case of the Mexican experience, we have a blended design. And this is something that we have mentioned during the day. Thank you, thank you very much. And then, 
from Piscinas from Tunisia and getting your experience as a framework. And Marcos, thank you very much for showing us what Brazil is doing about it. So, to put together all this, um, I mean, this is, uh, I'm just going to quote you. It's not that I'm just repeating you. No, I'm quoting you. I will be quoting you. And of course, I'm going to take advantage of your own style to repeat what you have said in a synthesis. So, to achieve transparency by design is to step up forward, not one at a time. It's a bunch of them at the same time. And it's working together as a society and that our societies can achieve. And it's something that we can corroborate, you know, because it's solid in the numbers. Because there is a public use. It is not only necessary to have more or less laws at a federal or local, local government. In the end, we have metrics that measure the law standards. Our friend from Tunisia, he mentioned that he had an amazing law that they are at the place of routine. What can I say about Australia? They are pioneers in the exercise of these of this of these matters and they have enlightened the world because of the Anglo Anglo Saxon tradition that they have. But also they have a lot of influence in Asia Pacific region as well as in Brazil. That even though Brazil looks through the Atlantic they have a representation here at the very moment. So the the, the glass through which we're measuring the scope of this situation means that in terms of proactive transparency and transparency by design, it's absolutely aligned, aligned to the points that we have. They have brought information of quality. Transparency by design is deep diving into the detail, going into the goal that is putting information as a constant subject of the public life is to go over the big challenges that we have in the long term, all of us in general, to get to know the news. The news are the novelties, the things that are happening now, what happens from today to tomorrow, and that is still relevant. Not only to know that we can look back at the past and check backwards on our history. For that, we also mentioned that we need to have an archive system in which we are going to manage all the documentation, and that is agile from scratch. And that we have the conditions that the society can just go and check, as when we go, just to set a poetic example, you go to a tree and you reach the fruit when you go over it. And know that we need to be jumping, trying to guess if it is an orange or an apple, you know? So, setting these kind of examples is like, we all know that we need to drink water. At least we get thirsty. In the past, is at least I I am from a little town. I used to drink tap water. No, I remember that every single morning when I was a kid, I would just drink tap water. You know, memories from 50 years ago, without any caution. And now we know that it needs to be that it needs to be at least purified. You know? That is kind of the situation. Transparency by design implies that the purification of the fruits of the state. The state needs to produce services, vital services, urgent services that cannot be delayed, that cannot have barriers. Nevertheless, the modern Leviathan, even in the most advanced democracies and in the intermediate democracies, because to talk about this in democracies, in the democracies that are bound to faint away because of, of the authoritarianism. A bad joke. 
towards those societies. It's sad to say that. But those societies, the democracies that have the elements to go further, we need to think about it. The business of transparency, as our friend from Tunisia said, which you need to take away the historic slabs that are over us. Those, that way of thinking that make us think that we do not deserve anything, that just to get what the state wants to provide and not what we need. So if the state sends a piano over the window, guess what's going to happen when we need selective information instead of just sending the exact keys that we need for the piano. What happens? Of course, we are going to be out for the count. Because they also can provide garbage information, you know, as spams, you know. The spams. So the state sometimes neutralizes us and they send a bunch of information that is useless. So the only goal that it has is to disinform. So with the transparency by design, we need to find new paths, new ways, new roads to go over of the basic will that the state sends alerts to us, distinguishing one from another. The warning is that when they get you ready and they tell you this is bound to happen, be careful. There's going to rain fire, stay at home, go to the basements, you know, just thinking about drama. But the alarm is when it is an earthquake. Now it is an earthquake, you know, it is happening now. Or a hurricane just forms out of the blue. You know? So between warnings and alerts, the state can, can change the life quality of the people. If transparency is not a fine point, as it happens, Julieta, I would like you to set some examples of the seekers, of all the things that we are doing from INAI and that are really good examples to set a value to of the things that we have. Why is it useful to have an arsenal of documents and information if people do not know how to look for what they need? Uh, I think that nowadays we are at a conform zone as a civilization. We have, as individuals, we have lost the capabilities. Uh, some some capabilities, for example, you don't need you need no longer to memorize telephone numbers or an address or how to get to a place. You know, so it is something that we have lost in this 21st century. No, we have lost some of our instincts because we're comfortable. So tra the proactive transparency is going to become vital to survive soon. It is something that we know with the pandemic. And come what may, we need to get ready. So, so these are the three experiences. I would like you to at the Mexican experience of this conference, of, of these mechanisms that you set at the press conference, so you know how in I and how the 32 state institutes are living a systematic experience to set a value of the things that we can get advantage of. Of course, we had resources to improve our national transparency platform that loads all the information from the country, we need to set more and better mechanisms to just get the best of what we have and to get the best information that we can. Thank you very much, thank you very much. Just to finish, I will allow to myself, as my colleague is asking me, in the morning you heard about the National Platform of Transparency. This is the Mexican platform that was developed in 2016 and that the national system of transparency that are the 32 local organs but the most strong thing in in the country are the 32 bodies that we have around the country this platform has improved and currently we have more than 7 million requests to access information and it has more than 8 million 
8,000 million of records in the platform. And also, I want to tell you that we have 10 search engines that help us that help us to input a word, and in less than a minute, you get all the incidences on that word. And the search engines can be contract services, social services, paperwork, governance bodies, resolutions. We're improving this platform. We're working with all the search engines. The security of the platform has been really stable. The platform is doing fine. We have we have gotten a lot of cyber attacks from January and from March we got more than nine million cyber cyber attacks. The platform is working, it's an amazing mechanism. All the local bodies feed it and it is a uh, a modern, a modern wonder, to be honest. We are really proud of ha having designed this platform for, for me, my colleagues. This platform is for everyone, and we have built it with our own hands. We are improving with the search engines, and we are looking for many, many ways. We have taken into account even the inclusion, inclusion, inclusion topics, and the Sinaloa state donated a tool for the gender inclusion so this platform has never fallen we are updating the security measures in the server are in the cloud so thank you very much for having what it is go ahead I just want to mention one thing Marcos mentioned this it is another great dilemma the problem of pairing the two circumstances, the data protection, personal data protection, and the right to access public information, as transparency of the public and the effectiveness of the private, of the things that are the intimate, the confidential. In the Mexican case, the frenzy for access information happened back in 2001. It became a law in 2002, and this year, it's been 20 years since the first legislation in such matter. So this happened in Mexico after. The data protection in Mexico came after that, with a lot of barriers set by the state, but not only by the Mexican state, but also by the insert of the big transnational, of the big platforms, of the big universal digital platforms, they try to block and delay and to make more complex the legislation work. So we have Josefina Roman, who is in command of the files problems, as the governor mentioned in the morning. But we, need, we must say that in Mexico, our laws were designed with these problems in, their, in our DNA. In the first place, we needed a legislation for the files and documentation that was adequate. And it is the last thing that is coming up on the table. In the first place, we have the access to information between a big distance to the emphasis on the transference transparency and access to information and it has been consolidated but but we have a crystal clear state but if this is crystal is foggy it's foggy no. so the thing is that we cannot see the details no. We do not need to be perverse or bailers. We just need to check if they are doing the things in the right way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Agradecemos a nuestros panelistas por su muy valiosa intervención. De esta manera concluye el tercer panel. So, de este primer día de trabajo de la décimo tercera eh, conferencia internacional de comisionadas y comisionados de la información.
Continuaremos eh, con un breve receso y retomaremos las actividades en unos minutos. Por, a todas y todos, muchas, muchas gracias.